So today we're going to be talking about Hohmann transfer orbits, and that's a way of changing between different circular orbits around uh, one central body. Uh, and so this is uh, applicable on a variety of different systems, like uh, satellites going around the Earth, right? So the space station, if it ever needs to change the distance away from the Earth that it's orbiting, um, it uses a Hohmann transfer orbit. And in today's example, we're gonna go from, we're gonna determine the speed we need to go from the Earth to Mars. Uh, and so what makes the Hohmann transfer orbit special, it's, it's just one uh, force acceleration, and it's the most efficient way to move between orbits. Um, and so I guess I'll just draw how the orbit should look like. And so this, this orange orbit is our transfer orbit. Um, and the idea is that we want to use, we want to create a capillarian orbit, and this makes it a lot more efficient so that we can kind of use the, the gravitational field of the sun, um, and it makes it easier to move between these different orbits. Um, and so this, this orange orbit, one thing to note is that the, it's orbiting around the sun. Um, it's not orbiting around Earth or the Mars. So if you were to just, if we had hypothetically a planet that followed this orange trajectory, it would be a third planet, and it would hit, it would cross the, um, or it would be tangent to the orbit at Earth and Mars at two different points. And so, just I guess, two uh, some basic stuff we have to cover first is um, parts of an elliptical orbit. So we have we have this an ellipse here, and this represents some orbit, and um, it's if we use Kepler's first law, we know that the sun here has to be at one of the foci, and that's that. And then there's the perihelion, which is the point on the orbit that's closest to the sun. And then there's the aphelion, which is the point on the orbit that's farthest from the sun. And so we're just going to denote the distances by RP and RA. And then we'll call R the distance between the sun and the planet. And that's just a variable, and that can represent really any, any position on the orbit. And then there's a special term called the semi-major axis, which is the major axis, which is the, the long wave cross divided by two, so RP plus RA over two. And then throughout the talk, um, I'm gonna denote sun with circle dot, earth with the circle cross, and then Mars with Mars. And so these three symbols just correspond to each object. Um, so we have our equations here. Um, these two we know, we're, we've given the gravitational potential energy that, and the speed of the circular orbit. These have been derived already. Uh, and then this, the vis view equation, is used to determine the speed of any object around an elliptical orbit. And the der derivation is pretty long, so I won't go through that, but I'll cover um, just some basic concepts that we can use to derive it. Uh, and the rest is just algebraic manipulation. So uh, we can use the conservation of energy. So we'll just say big E is the total energy. And that's half, you know, the kinetic energy is half mv squared. And ms, I'm just gonna denote that for the mass of the satellite. Uh, and then va. So what va is, is the velocity at the aphelion. So the velocity at the farthest point. Um, and then we know that that's equal, and then the potential energy is this, so GMM over X. So it's minus the gravitational constant over the mass. In this case, big M, we'll just say this is sine. And then the distance it's given is the R, R sub A. Um, but because this is a, a closed system where we have conservation of energy, so we can also say that this is equal to this point, the perihelion. So it's half m at v sub p squared minus v sub p. And so that's our first equation. And then we can use also conservation of angular momentum. And we 
haven't covered that in class before, but it's just uh, MBR. Um, so the mass of the satellite times the velocity at the map helium times r sub a, and that's equal to the, the angular momentum at the perihelion. So m and sub p. Um, and so we have these two conserved quantities, and if the, the only there's only two unknowns here, which are the velocities at the app helium and the perihelion. We know the radius, we know the masses. Those are all uh, given constants. So if we do some manipulation, we get that the total energy is equal to negative g m m or sort of. Um, and this total energy looks really familiar because it's the same. If we replace the A with R, that's the total energy of a circular orbit. Um, which makes sense because if we're looking at an oval, um, an ellipse versus the semi-major axis of a circle is just R. So if this is a circle, our ellipse is actually a circle, we just replace A with R. That works out to be good. Uh, and then if we plug E here back into this equation, um, we get that d squared is equal to gm2 over r. And so this is uh, the vis viva equation. And then we can use this to determine the velocity at any given point on an elliptical orbit. So now the idea is that we're moving. So the, what, the question is, it's not how much velocity does the rocket need at the surface of the uh, Earth. Because that's, we can use the escape velocity formula for that, and that's a pretty routine procedure. What we're doing is we're imagining if we have some sort of rocket here, and it's traveling with the same velocity as the Earth. So it's, it might be a later booster stage, and it's already out of the orbit of Earth. And, but it's moving with the same, in the, it's the initial velocity of the rocket is the same as the velocity of the, um, of the Earth. So what we want to be able to do is, instead of, if we were to leave this the rocket at rest, it would kind of follow this path along the, um, the Earth's orbit. But we want it to kind of transform into this orange orbit. So how do we have to do that? We have to make sure that the rocket here has the same velocity as, has to have enough velocity to kind of satisfy this orange curve. And so we have to just use the, this Viva equation to find the velocity of the rocket um, if it wants to stick onto this orange curve. And so let me and so we know that the so the velocity we're looking for, I'll call this orbit t. So the velocity sub t at the perihelion, because it's closer. We know that Earth is closer to the sun than Mars is. So this is the perihelion. Is equal to, we're going to use this equation. So gm. And we know that the distance between the sun and the Earth is one astronomical unit. And that's just by definition. So 2 over 1 minus 1 over. And then the semi-major axis, it's just the average of the um, RP and RA. And we know that the distance from the moon, um, from Mars to the Earth, is 1.5 astronomical units. So the semi-major axis has to be 1.25. And we take the square root of that. So we get that. We get that the velocity at this point on the orange orbit is about uh, thirty two thousand seven hundred meters per second. So thirty two point seven kilometers per second. Um, and so that's if. If we want it to stick on that orange path, it needs to have that velocity. Um, but then, what we have to figure out the initial velocity of the rocket. The 
initial velocity of the rocket, we can just use the speed of the circular orbit of the Earth. Because we're just assuming that like they're moving together. Uh, and so the velocity of the Earth, if we plug in uh, gm over r here, comes out to be around 29,800 meters. And you can just plug in the values into our equation here, uh, and you can figure that out. So we know that GTP and so delta V has to be the difference between these two zones. And delta V comes out to be around 2.9 kilometers per second. So between so once we launch our rocket and it's you know it's left the orbit of Earth but it's still moving with Earth, it needs to increase its velocity by 2.9 kilometers per second. And so the way rockets would do this is you want it to be pretty instantaneous. So we're imagining that this acceleration of is this increase in 2.9 kilometers per second is instantaneous and it will it'll transform the orbit from this purple circular orbit to this orange elliptical orbit. And the reason is we're adding this velocity so the kinetic energy of the rocket is increasing. So now the, suddenly the total energy of the entire rocket, uh, the rocket system is has increased. Um, and if we know our orbits and we know that our orbits circle would be this and once we add more energy we can if we use our earlier equation for energy we know that the bigger the more the energy the larger the semi major axis the semi major axis um, so we know that the um, we know that the rocket has to move on to this orange orbit now. But if we were to just leave the rocket with this velocity, 32.7 kilometers per second, once it reached this point, now that the rocket is here, it's gonna continue, it's gonna stick on this orange path. So we need to give it another increase in velocity so that it follows the path of Mars. And the way we do that is the exact same. say, we want to find, we first need to find the velocity of this uh, rocket at this orange point up here. Um, and so the radius, we know that the radius now, it's the distance is, it's at Mars now, but it's on the orbit of Mars. So the distance must be 1.5 astronauts. And we're still in the same orbit. We're still in this orange trajectory. So the distance, the semi-major axis, is still 1.25 astronomical units. Uh, and this should be true. Um, and now we're at the aphelion. So it's V sub TA. Because now we're farther away. We're at the farthest point on the trajectory from the sun. We're all the way up here. Um, plug in values again, you'll get that the speed of the rocket is approximately 21,800. So the rocket has slowed down by the point, by the time it's over here, and that should come pretty easily from Kepler's second law, because we know that the area swept out in given times of the same. So if it's farther, it has to be, if this distance is longer, this must be moving slower. So this, we know that this makes sense. It's smaller than 20, 32.7. And then we're going to use our speed of the circular orbit again to find the speed of Mars. And the speed of Mars comes out to be twenty.
So it comes out to be around 24 kilometers per second. So the Mars is orbiting slower than what the Earth is. And so once again, to get the, the change in velocity needed, we just take the difference. So that should come out to be So that's how we transform a rocket from this orbit, from Earth's orbit, to the Mars orbit. So it's, we need to give it a 2.9 kilometer per second increase to switch from the purple orbit to the orange orbit. And once we're on this orange orbit, by, by the point we reach, we intersect Mars's orbit, we need to give it another 2.2 kilometer per second increase. Um, and so that way, we can, um, this rocket, able to land on Mars. In reality, there's a lot more to it because we have to figure out this, uh, how much velocity needs to be on the surface. It needs to leave Earth's surface first. And then same thing here. The, in reality, the rocket needs to decelerate a lot because it needs to be able to land on Mars. So there's that calculation that we need to figure out. But in the meanwhile, we know now how to change orbits. And so this kind of Hellman transfer comes up a lot in like this exact type where we the second increase in velocity comes in a lot more when we're dealing with satellites. We need to increase the radius of the satellite. This is a lot easier to do. So then I guess the last question that you know left to the viewer is um, we have to calculate the angle between Mars and Earth for the um, time of launch. So we have to find this angle. Like what's the relative So that should be pretty easy if you use Kepler's third law, because we know now we know that we know the speed of Mars, we know the speed of Earth, um, and we know the orbital trajectory. So we should be able to. So when you're doing this on your own, you should figure out what the period of this orbital trajectory is, and then kind of figure out well, Mars needs to be over here. Earth needs Mars and Earth they need to be opposite of each other, and then you just reverse the time. Find the initial position of Earth and Mars. So that's all. Thank you for your time.